be behind a stone wall, more or less. There is also on a ridge called Cemetery Ridge. Between them, there is a no man's land of about a mile, which is just farmland. It's just flat farmland, but the two ridges are very high, and the middle is the farmland. Halfway through the second day, General Hancock, who's in charge of the Second Corps, period, Union guy, he sends the 8th Ohio Volunteers, which include, of course, the Hibernian Guards, and O'Reilly, Butler, and Galway. He sends them out to the middle of the field, the other place called the Emmonsburg Road. He said, just go out and take a place here with them outside the perimeter of the stone wall. They're in the middle of the battlefield, right about here. So they spend the night there. They try to get back in, and they, they're warned, don't, because the Confederates will just wipe you up and try and get back over the open ground. So they're behind a fence in the middle of the battlefield, second day. Third day, General Lee says, look, we got to win this war. The enemy is out there, meeting over at Cemetery Ridge, and we're going to take him where he is. So with that, he decides on a great infantry charge, which will ever after be called Pickett's Charge. Uh, perhaps it should have been called Longstreet's Charge. It's Pickett's Charge. There's a great cannonade, which takes place, huge artillery project, takes place for about an hour on the third day, and it's intensified with the terrible July heat. Cannonade was the greatest barrage ever effected on the North American continent. It was heard as far away as Pittsburgh. It knocked down a lot of uh, horses and some wagons, no guns, and no Union soldiers. They just sat behind the stone wall. Poor O'Reilly Butler and the 8th Ohio guys are sitting out in the middle of the battlefield. They say, boy, this charge is coming. They're going to come right at us. So the cannonade stops, and General Lee, acting in the mistaken belief, that he has silenced all the Union guns, now orders his great infantry assault. 15,000 men, the flower of the Confederate Army, is marching headlong into the legend of Pickett's Charge. Well, suddenly the bugles play and the drums roll, and all of a sudden out of the woods comes the Confederate Army, huge and menacing. Start down the, the, the ramp, shoulder to shoulder, this, this gallant act of archaic chivalry. And the poor guys in the 8th Ohio, including the Hibernian Guards, say, hey, they're coming right at us. They're going to wipe us out. 15,000 men are coming at us. They've only got 217 men. But they didn't. Pickett's charge starts veering away over to the center of the field. They're coming. They're coming about this way now as he marched across the field in this, this, this gallant act of archaic chivalry, Union guns on the other side over here never stopped shooting them down. They tear great big holes in their lines, but they dress the lines, you know, get closer together, and they keep on marching, but they know they're getting some fire from uh, at the top of the hill. All of a sudden, 8th eight, Ohio, and this, according to the eyewitnesses later, was instigated by James K. O'Reilly, my late great grandfather in law he picks the 8th Ohio and the Hibernian Guards, and they suddenly come out of their little hiding place and they fire point blank into the side of Pickett's charge. It's Pickett's starting down the hill. Pickett's troops, the 15,000, start down the hill and across the plain. 8th Ohio comes out of nowhere and starts shooting them in the side on the flank. It was a terrible. Uh, folly that killed an awful lot of Confederates and some in Rock and Raw's the extreme left of Pickett's division say we can't stand this the shooting is from the front now the shooting is from the side they turn and they go back and with them go the flags so if you're in Pickett's charge you're going forward we're going to make a gang rip. you see uh oh there's some flags going back the other way that's kind of a downer well Rock and Raw goes back now the 8th Ohio turns and they keep on charging. They hit the next division, which is Davis's brigade of Confederates. They fire on their side. They can't stand the terrible fire close, point blank range. They're getting hit really hard. They may go back. So now we start to think maybe the 8th Ohio is going to change American history. And maybe it did. So as they keep driving, they drove the two Confederate brigades back to their lines. The rest keep on going. They cross the uh, Emmitsburg Road, go up the other side, Union guns still shooting them down. They kneel, get off one round, get the rebel yell, and charge into the Union line at the top of the hill. There's not many of them left. Those who are still alive suddenly are engulfed by Confederate reinforcements. who come from all over, and these pickets charge
starts, what remains of it is suddenly surrounded and engulfed, and anyone who still has uh, their gun throws it down and surrenders. The whole high tide of the Confederacy is now ebbing back to Robert E. Lee's own regretful words. He says, you know, it's all my fault. It is all my fault. Because he's a man of epic proportions. And also because it was all his fault. It's about the toughest character. <laughs> anyway, the April now had a lot to do with it. That was the high tide of the Confederacy. They did not come north again. The war, uh, that is a poor uh, depiction of the picture charts. It was very confusing. This is what was left after the 8th Ohio fired at, on the uh, Virginia troops of Rock and Rolls. Terrible amount of damage. This is the high point of Pickett's Charge where they almost got to but didn't quite. And ever after, uh, the war comes to an end in 1865. Of the 217 guys in the Hibernian Guard, Company B, uh, 103 were killed that afternoon, July 3rd, in that attack against Pickett's left. But on the other hand, maybe they really changed American history. Well, all three of the guys that I mentioned came home intact. Uh, they had a great parade on an afternoon in May of 1865. It went from Water Street, now West 9th, to Erie Street, now East 9th, on Superior. And 10,000 Ohio veterans marched down Superior Street and ever after they're going to be called the Grand Army, the Republic, the GAR, the Control Republican Politics. But on this particular afternoon, they marched down the, there was the horse artillery and there was the cavalry and there was all the Ohio brigades and what a glorious day it was. And believe it or not, according to the newspaper, Cleveland's own Leland's Regimental Brass Band was there again. And they pay, played what the newspaper called, quote, appropriate patriotic airs, like the girl I left behind me, and John Brown's body, and when Johnny comes marching again, home again. But for the scores of thousands of lightless, and limbless, and dying and dead young men lying in hospital cots throughout the land, there were no parades, and there were no appropriate songs. It is something to brood over. Thank you.